but I'm not scared. I'm, I'm scared a little bit. Are Square Enix games actually good or is it all just nostalgia and hype? Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has been getting raving reviews, but it's definitely not for everyone. I know that could be said about any game that comes out. People will like it, people will hate it, but Square Enix in particular falls right into that sweet spot. Right in that sweet spot where people either love their games with a passion or hate them and will never play them. There's no really in between. In order to answer this question, we're going to be diving into some categories. If you've seen my videos before, you already know the deal. By the way, speaking of previous videos, if you are at all interested as to why everyone's obsessed with Helldivers 2, go ahead and click the video in the link down below. Do it. My name is Gookie. If you didn't already know, I'm excited to talk about some Square Enix today. Before moving on to the categories, for the purpose of this video, I do want to make it clear that Square Enix has a ridiculous category of games. Like, it's, it's it's insane how many games they have. Today, we're only looking at the heavy hitters, the highest grossing titles within the company that really solidify its popularity within the gaming industry. Of course, that includes the Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, and Kingdom Hearts series. Without further ado, let's... Who says... Without further... Let's go ahead and dive into the first category here. A lot of people actually consider the Final Fantasy games to be the saving grace of Square Enix. It wouldn't be the company it is today, and it maybe wouldn't be around at all if it wasn't for Final Fantasy. But to truly understand this, we have to take a look at the story from the beginning. Let's go ahead and take a look at the timeline in the history of Square Enix. Enix was founded in 1975, while Square was founded a couple years later in 1986 as a spinoff of an electronics company. That's right, before Square Enix was a thing, it was was Square and Enix. Square unfortunately found itself financially struggling early on and they needed a big hitter game in order to keep them on the market. They came up with an RPG concept for a game following the major commercial success of Dragon Quest, which happened to be owned by Enix at the time. Everything is making sense. This concept then turned into the game, you guessed it, Final Fantasy. And so the mega series was born. Final Fantasy released in 1987 in Japan and then later in the Western Hemisphere. Sometime after, Square and Enix got together and what happens when two companies love each other they make a company baby the name must have taken them so long to figure out Final Fantasy went on to lie about the final part of their fantasy and released 16 main games. Dragon Quest also released 11 main games in the series, both having a ridiculous amount of spin-offs and other media created about the franchises. Following the major success of both titles, Square Enix was ready to cast their next net, something that appealed more to the Western audience. What better way to cast a net than to throw it over a bunch of Disney-loving suckers? I hate to admit, but this is when they got me. <laughs> in 2002, Kingdom Hearts made a big splash. I'm killing it with these fish references. Appealing heavily to Western audiences with Disney World's concepts and characters merging with the Square Enix properties. This crossover also saw a lot of success with three main games in the series and then a ridiculous amount of spin-offs, as you may have guessed because that's kind of like their MO now. Now that we understand Square Enix is a company and their history, this sets us up perfectly to talk about the Square Enix formula. This is actually why they've seen so much success and popularity with their titles making Square Enix a massive company within the gaming industry. I feel like I'm about to break down the like Krabby Patty formula here. This is this is pretty exciting. This is actually what I'm most scared talking about because I feel like I'm going to get something wrong, some small detail wrong. Yeah, okay. Well, let's uh head into the first part here, their insane stories. Throughout every single game, they come up with this ridiculous convoluted story. They throw insane characters, story, and lore at you, and you're left with a freaking concussion after all of that. At this point, I think I've seen, I, I shit you not, hundreds of hours in videos trying to explain Kingdom Hearts to me. This is a game that I played as a as a kid, and before Kingdom Hearts 3 came along, I was like, hey, maybe I should understand what's going on in the story. Just kind of assuming that as a kid, I didn't understand because I was a dumb child with my dumb seven-year-old brain, but my dumb 27-year-old brain does not understand the concept behind those games either. This is Roxas. This is Ventus. They are not the same person, but they sort of are. This guy's name is Ansem. This guy's name is also Ansem. They are not the same person. Xemnas is also sort of Ansem, and so is Riku when he's evil. This, this is Riku, by the way. Everybody pretty much stems from this guy, Xehanort. Well, this is Terra Xehanort, which is older than this old guy named Xehanort. I, I really want to sit down in the storyboard sessions behind these games and just see what the hell they're doing. I swear they're just throwing shit at walls and seeing what sticks. Okay, we're gonna try something here. Thank <laughs> you. 
In a village where chicken wore fancier hats than their owners, there cowered a panicky house that made even the ghosts nervous. Haunted Anno de house. No prepping house. Together they stumbled upon a jazzy camp where the clams apparently fancied themselves as jazz musicians. Jazzical vina clam. <laughs> That's really honestly how it feels playing a Kingdom Hearts game or a Final Fantasy game. It's like the basics of the main story you can sort of kind of follow as you're playing the game, but there's so many concepts and so many characters that they throw at you that just are there to thoroughly confuse you. For the most part, when you're playing one of these games, you can follow the main story very loosely. But then when you think you're following the main concept, this random character will jump in, introduce themselves, talk about their backstory, tell you they hate you and they're gonna destroy everything you love and then they leave and you're like, who, who was that? Why are they here? Here's the pros and the cons to having a story told in this manner. Let's start with Kingdom Hearts in particular. They are simple dialogue and easy to follow conversations with each of the characters that are very recognizable because of their Disney brand and or Final Fantasy fantasy brand makes it at least enjoyable to follow whatever you can follow about the story because for the most part the interactions that these characters are having with each other are very charming and although you may not fully understand it at the time if you haven't played the 1.5 0.6.7 version of the game, you still see some sort of character arc and you still fall in love with these characters. The name Sora resonates with every single Kingdom Hearts fan and you got Mickey and Goofy and Donald. It's really hard not to fall in love with these characters as they present themselves to you. Whether you're somebody that knows every single character and every single backstory and can really dive deep into the convoluted lore that the games have, sorry for my voice, or you're somebody that hasn't paid attention to much and is just playing along, it can be an enjoyable experience. So that covers the pros, but then looking into the cons of this type of storytelling. If you're the type of person that enjoys a beginning, middle, and end to a game, you're not gonna get that satisfaction out of this. There is so much going on and so much lore behind every single entry to the series, even though it's only a three-part game, that you're not gonna get everything unless you've played every single game. Out of the three main entries, there's 13 games available for Kingdom Hearts. And every single one of them has a ridiculous amount of lore that is imperative to really truly understanding the overarching story. Don't get me wrong, there are people in the world that have done this, that have played every single game and truly do understand the story, but that is a very niche, small percentage of people that are actually willing to put that amount of work in. Even looking at just availability of the game, some of them aren't even accessible on the PlayStation, so you have to have all of these consoles to be able to play these games. It just doesn't seem feasible to be able to do something like that. Final Fantasy games, not as convoluted as Kingdom Hearts, but still very much ridiculous. Every single Final Fantasy game has its own world its own lore, its own story, so they're not interconnected like you might think. These games will tell a lot of their story through their ridiculously long cutscenes. I'm talking put your controller down, go make some popcorn, and watch the movie that you're about to watch in order to play the game. <laughs> Let's talk about the remakes of Final Fantasy VII in particular here. Not talking about Final Fantasy VII or this one or this one or this one or this one or this Final Fantasy VII. Or th Without spoiling anything, right? The remakes also take a little bit of a freedom in twisting up the story from the original game that came out, which means you have your original game story, which is already a lot of lore packed into one game, a lot of game in that game, and then you have the remake story, which includes a lot of that lore, but also changes it ever so slightly to introduce new characters, to introduce different concepts to it. Even just talking about this is hurting my brain. My brain is actively turning into pink mist. Dragon Quest kind of follows the same suit as the Final Fantasy games. The first three were a continuous story, but then every single one after that was its own thing. And I think I've pretty much made my point as to why these games really aren't for everyone. They're going to miss the mark for a lot of people that just can't get into the rest of the mechanics of the game without getting into the story first. Speaking of the rest of the mechanics of the game, the next concept that we're going to go over within the Square Enix formula is the cinematic overload. Borderline, if not way deep into the cringe. <laughs> I mean, I don't even really feel like I need to say anything about this. It sort of speaks for itself here. You had enough? Cause I'm willing to call it a draw if you are. From where I stood, the only thing you drew was a big L on your forehead for loser, lame, laughable. You did it. Yeah. Uh, because I'm you. No, I'm me. I'm me, he says. <laughs> I knew when I met you. 
You and Kyrie smell the same. Survival can be a matter of luck or skill. And you can't rely on luck. Words to live by. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks. The news outlets are nothing but Shinra mouthpieces spewing propaganda. Only dumbasses believe that shit. Question. Does that make me a dumbass? I remember you exceedingly well. Although, it's those memories I'd soon erase. I don't know what you're saying. My heart was aching. That's why I kept going. Oh, thank you, Sora's heart. <laughs> what? That's ridiculous. Is that a smile I spy? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, it's not safe here. We should go. There are people that will take enjoyment out of watching something like this and others that will not see the funny and the charm behind it, but will see it as cringe. And that just is what it is. I think a big part of it really is cultural differences with the way they tell the stories in Japan versus in the Western Hemisphere. And that will be a big mark missed for a lot of people here. Moving on to quick time events with absolutely no consequences. Coming in with my own biased opinion about quick time events, which I don't really think I love. I think very few quick time events are actually done in a way that's effective and add value to the playing the game portion of, you know, any video game. But with that being said, even though I don't love quick time events in general, I, I think adding consequences to a quick time event is definitely important to making it more enjoyable. And for some reason, that just doesn't it's not a thing. <laughs> this is definitely in order to make these games more accessible to everybody. I mean, there's things within Final Fantasy games that I find you can do to make the game just ridiculously easy. And instead of being a game where you're actually actively struggling and being challenged the entire time, it just becomes an experience so that you can enjoy the story, if you can enjoy the story. Cinematic evasion, press R1 before the time runs out. You want me to fail it? All right. <laughs> oh, that's so good. That's so good. <laughs> So the quick time events being absolute bullshit is actually, it's, it's a funny thing to me. It doesn't ruin it, but it, it doesn't, why, why have quick time events? But moving on, talking about a plus in the formula is recognizable concepts sprinkled throughout the entirety of their games. For example, you see something and you're like, oh yeah, this is a Square Enix game. They stick to the theme and stick on brand religiously, which is a really good nod to the people that have been fans of their games. These things and these iconic ideas that they've been able to create work great and they're able to use nostalgia to really keep people coming back. Some of these concepts include, but of course are not limited to, the chocobos, the summons, recurring characters, a lot of the consumables that they'll have throughout their games, including ether, high potions, phoenix downs, etc. They've done a fantastic job at creating this universe, to be completely honest with you. Whether or not you like their games, I think having a recognizable, you know, idea or concept is something that everybody could appreciate. It's very commendable to come up with such iconic concepts and continue to use them throughout their games to bring people back to them. I want to talk about how Square Enix has modernized their games, which is something that's a little bit hard to do and hard to compare because of the vast library of games that Square Enix has. So let's narrow it down to two games in particular, the two most recent titles, Final Fantasy VII Remake and Rebirth. Modernizing their games is where I think the company has actually shined. A lot of the concepts that they've changed and modernized throughout the years have been significant enough to bring new players to the franchise, but not so significant that they're going to lose the original vision that they had with their Final Fantasy games. They changed the combat mechanics to be more responsive in real time, but they also kept the original combat mechanics in there too. The graphics in the worlds have been updated and look absolutely stunning. The characters continue to keep their charm and are very true to the original characters, even though they look completely different and you can actually see facial expressions this time around. And a lot of the mechanics, of course, have been updated to reflect a lot of quality of life additions. Although a lot of these mechanics do modernize the gameplay and introduce these games for an entirely new audience, a younger audience that may not have played the original. I don't personally believe that if you hated the original, you'll love this game. It's still very much a Final Fantasy game, and if you're not a fan of the Final Fantasy series or the franchise, or really any Square Enix title because of the things that I've mentioned before, the storytelling, the mechanics, etc., then this isn't something that's going to change your mind because of the fact that they have stayed true to the original formula. I commend Square Enix for this because they didn't try to change their game 
game ridiculously to please a whole new audience. They kept it true to the original and keep the fan base that already exists and is already so passionately in love with these types of games happy. If I had to give at least one critique with what they've done modernizing their games, it would have to be with their animations. The extremely long and awkward animations that it takes to do the simplest of tasks can get a little bit taxing after a while after playing the game for a very long time. Of course, it adds to the cinematics and it's over the top and it's really cool to see the first time, but the second, third, and 15th time you've had to do the same animation for the simplest of tasks can get a little bit annoying. The last concept that I want to go over is the composition, the soundtrack within the games. This one, out of every other concept within this formula, I think is the one that is the most solid as far as everyone can agree on the fact that it's good. A soundtrack can have a ridiculously big impact on a game or a game series. Music does a lot. It plays on emotion, it plays on memorability and recognizability. It really does have the ability to make or break a moment within a game. And not just moments either. Aside from the soundtrack while you're playing the game, while you're running around, while you're in combat or during a boss fight, they have ridiculously awesome menu sound effects and soundtracks as well. They had no business going that hard. There you guys go, the secret Krabby Patty formula for Square Enix games. Boy, I sure do hope Plankton's not watching this. I put together this video because out of my close circle of friends, we're all gamer nerds. We all love video games. I'm the only one that bought and is enjoying Final Fantasy VII, which really just got me to thinking about the differences that these games have that don't appeal to certain people. This may be a bold statement, and of course it's purely speculation, but I do think a big part of it is the cultural differences. I hit on it a little bit before, but Square Enix is a Japanese company that stays very true to the way that they portray their games. And although they've done a great job at appealing to the Western masses, they definitely stayed true to their formula. The storytelling, the humor, and the charm behind these games is a niche. I put together these commentary style videos in order to have good old video game discussions, so please tell me your thoughts down in the comments below. Do you agree or disagree with a lot of the things that I said? Go ahead and let me know. I'll be active down there saying hi and talking shit. You guys can be the ones to influence the next video. I would love if you could take some time down below to ask me a question about gaming. Try to keep it, you know, relevant to what's going on today so that I can keep the series alive and continue to do videos like this in the future. But other than that, you guys, thank you so much for watching. I can't wait to see you guys in the next video. Bye!